I want to begin by asking you to think about the word motive. Now, when I say motive, most of you will think of crime. What is the motive behind a crime? But I'm asking you to think a little bit more broadly. The word motive comes from the Latin root movere, which means to move. So we can, use to, we can use it to ask for insight. Why are we moved to do and think the things we think and do? Why are we moved or, we, or are inspired? Um, so we can also ask why are we moved through frustrations to do certain things? How are other entities like your friends, your parents, advertising, governments, or even um, persistent and amazing teachers moving you to accept things? Today, I want to begin by talking about three things that really inspire me, that I really care about. I'm fascinated by our digital culture and our personal technologies. And when I say personal technologies, I mean everything that you carry with you that really forms part of your identity. Your phone, your, your watch if you have one, um, your camera, your music, your apps. All of this is really your personal digital cloud. So the second thing I care about is the motive behind why we're moved to use these personal technologies and what are the motives behind technology and why, what's driving our adoption or, to them. And the third thing is I care about the future. I really want to know what we will use in the future when it comes to, to the digital and digital culture. And so I really care about predictions, um, forecasting of the future. And I want to track prediction about our digital culture so that we can start to understand it now. So I want to begin today by sharing an example of a new personal technology that is so sensationalized, I think it's difficult for us to catch hold of what it will mean for us as everyday people. Intel wants brain implants in its customers' heads by 2020. Researchers expect brainwaves to operate computers, TVs, and cell phones. So even though this quote is seven years old, to me, this is one of the most provocative journalistic quotes of the decade. The sentence is so alluring because it's as if Popular Science, Popular Science magazine is speaking to us as if from the future, as if knowing what's going to happen to us. And really, it's a prediction about your digital life. And it went along with another claim. Imagine being able to search the web with the power of your thoughts. Imagine being able to search the web with the power of your thoughts. So this one is interesting too. This is from a scientist speculating about the future when brain implants seem normal. So he's, again, speculating about our futures. And he goes on to say in specifics, If we can get to the point where we can accurately detect specific words, you could mentally type. So he's describing an aspect of his process as a computer scientist, and I'd like to add one more quote to this. One day, I believe we'll be able to send full, rich thoughts to each other directly using technology. So I won't lie, for, for me, this is so provocative because it is spoken by Facebook CEO, Mr. Mark Zuckerberg, a man who has incredible ethos, a man who has immense wealth, and think about it, he has the world's imagination in his grip. Here we have the head of Facebook uh, predicting, proposing something that is quite futuristic, and if you think about it, maybe a little bit wacky. The idea of brain-computer implants and telepathy um, is beginning to go mainstream, even though this is a long ways off from ever happening, and really, it might never happen. What exactly are we talking about here? Telepathy is the transformer transmission of information from one person to another without using any of our known sensory channels or physical interaction. So what they are talking about is digital telepathy. But at the moment, the broader goal for us is it's being sensationalized. Um, and we're getting very excited about it and about the tech. And I know that I certainly am. Um, everything would change. Work, life, school, all would change. If you think about it, social media would change dramatically. Many of you, I'm sure, are connected right now to Snapchat, Instagram, and Twitter. Would we begin to send our likes and faves instantly just by thinking about it, um, without ever swiping or clicking? And don't you think maybe crazy things would happen? 
I couldn't help myself. <laughs> Just imagine what would happen to viral videos. Um, Miranda Sings would be everywhere in everyone's minds, and I'd never get her videos out of my head. S students would be sending videos to me constantly. Or worse, what if you, get, uh, what if you sent someone an embarrassing thought? You'd never get it back. But seriously, uh, let's think about it a little bit more. Will we be more creative in a world with digital telepathy? Will we have groupthink projects where our students begin to imagine ways to solve the world's problems? Or will these apps dig into our, our minds and our hearts to sell us more? Will it use our thoughts as commodity items, um, as marketing tools that, that aggregate our thoughts? Who will own our thoughts in this future? I think we need to question what is our role and what are the motives at work with this proposition. In my research, I start to ask, are we going to be passive participants in all of this? What do we really care about? Will there be privacy? Can we imagine our own sense of privacy in this future? Will it better us or will it hurt us? And ultimately, will we be dehumanized by it? I don't think anyone has set a malicious agenda for this technology, but I do think we need to ask hard questions now. I'd like to give you a bit of a backstory of how I ended up here, because I think it kind of explains my research. After high school, um, I finished an undergrad degree in literature, in English. I studied poetry, fiction, drama, all of which explore human creativity and human motive. And I really loved it. Right after I graduated, I didn't know what I was going to do for a career. Uh, I was lucky enough to, be, to meet an inventor who was looking to start up a digital company. He was an entrepreneur, and he wanted to hire someone specifically who studied literature and who loved language. And so I, took, I threw caution to the wind, uh, took a risk, and went down a path and worked for a very small sum of money so that I could earn ownership in the company um, that we started together. And he was a great mentor to me. So for several years, we worked, uh, sold new digital products, and it really wasn't very glamorous. I worked in a basement. Uh, the pipes froze beside my desk. I didn't take any holiday time off. But I learned to be a computer interface designer, designing screens for people. And I, I spent an incredible amount of time reimagining the human-computer relationship, I was able to use my love of language and literature that I gained as a student. So I went on to do a PhD because I wasn't done yet. I, wanted to, I loved school. I wanted to be in school. And I did my PhD in rhetorical studies, concentrating on wearable technology and invention. Rhetoric is the study of the art of persuasion, and it's a field that started by Aristotle more than 2,000 years ago. We have to think of the ancient philosophers as mentors for us. So I tried to answer and start to think about how and why people are persuaded to think things and do things, and how we're motivated to act. And that's how I use rhetoric. If you think about it, invention is a persuasive act. If Intel, for example, wants you to think you will have digital telepathy for whatever reason, and I'm sure there are many reasons, a social action is taken. So this leads me to the kinds of research questions like, how are, or, and why are we persuaded or motivated to believe that a future technology is a good idea now, long before we ever use it or see it? When there is nothing to see, nothing to test, just an idea, why are we so convinced that a certain invention will solve a certain need? And what is that need? And more importantly, what, will, what is the fallout in 2013, I published a book called Ready to Wear, which is a book about the idea that we'll eventually wear technology on the body at all times, and, um, the, and the, our devices all the time. Forbes estimates by 2017, the wear, wearable devices are projected to grow to $20 billion in sales. So most of my research is about a future, farther into the future than 2017. And as future protect predicted technologies march on, we need to understand the motives driving inventors to create, companies to sell, and we as consumers to embrace. In my book, I argue that our futures are framed according to what I call a continuum of embodiment, 
which is about culture more than technology. It means that our personal devices are becoming more and more a part of us until eventually we'll, we will accept the idea of implanting them and that it will seem normal um, way before it will ever happen. How many people here have checked a device in the last five minutes? A phone? Oh, you, you're quite modest. I think many of you have. <laughs> um, we have been thoroughly socialized to mobile culture, and we don't really question its motives any longer. We simply accept it. The mobile revolution happened, as far as I'm concerned, 10 years ago when iPod sales hit 100 million, and that was in 2007. Um, that meant that smartphones came into a world where we were already uh, completely used to using mobile technology. There was a strong cultural foundation. And that was only a decade ago. So the second movement is towards wearable tech. We're rapidly transforming towards a completely hands-free model with our technology. Many of you are beginning to adopt, as I said, smartwatches, Fitbits, fitness shirts, all that read your biometric information all the time. There are increasingly new medical devices that will track us always for, our, for illness, fitness, and health. One of them that fascinates me very much is uh, this next phase of wearables with things like digital skin or epidural electronics that have the amazing ability to sense muscle, heart, and brain activity. They will be so subtle that people will make them part of their person, part of their digital identity, and they will be hidden and self-centric. Another trending idea that I've been writing a lot about of lately is the digital contact lens, or the bionic contact. It's planned to be a future wearable display. It would replace your phone display. So instead of reading texts and looking at Instagram on your phone, it would come across your field of vision on these lenses. Um, it's not yet released by any company, but many big companies are working on developing this. So that's another idea for a future that hasn't happened yet. The other cultural motivator for all things wearable is science fiction, film, gaming, and popular culture. For example, when we're young, playing with Lego, we dream of exosuits. We dream of our own technological futures in the games we play. Think of all the movies that feature a guy wearing a high-tech suit, facilitating his every computing need. And for me, as it was said in my introduction, I love Iron Man, and I think Iron Man is a great exemplar for what will happen to us in the future. Our studies show that this celebration of technology also changes the way inventors actually invent and the way wearable tech is designed and the way that we as consumers are adopting it. Okay, so implantables. Devices will be miniaturized to the point of being invisible. Nanotech devices at the other end of the continuum will be infiltrated into the body. So we want our tech to feel as if it's a bodily extension um, the, these are embodied technologies include things like biochips, RFID, RFID trackers under the skin, and human enhancement augmentation. And this is where Intel's brain implant and telepathy will ultimately go. There are, these are really the most personal of personal technologies. Implantables will also rope us or link us into a digital economy. If you think about it, if we implant our tech, we will be attached to a sea of other people and devices and companies through computer algorithms that will always be calculating, interpreting, and predicting our actions. The future will be so different, and we need to understand and ask about motive now. We, beyond being sensationalized by personal tech, we need to understand what will, what, the ways we will benefit and the ways we might lose. Now, in my research, um, my research is housed in Decimal Lab at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology, and I'm lucky enough to have associates and students who help me, and we mentor each other now. We've begun to outfit the lab with many technologies that have just been released, like this holographic 3D display. And we study home-based tech rather than work-based tech. Um, that is one of our value systems in the lab. We want to, want to understand what it will be like for everyday people. I love this picture. This is a photo of a person trying our tech at a conference in Japan. It is one of the things we study is brain-computer interaction. And these are the technologies that are presupposing a future in digital telepathy. 
So this does basic, um, it's an EEG technology, it, it can measure brainwave fluctuation, and we, we have made iMind, that's what we call it, an arts project to participate um, with digitized paintings. When you wear it, it reads your emotion and tries to select the right painting that matches with that emotion. So it concentrates on creativity and control rather than consumerism, for example. We are really in an era of technogenesis and we need to think about our future and the motives that are being used to get us there. We need to address outcomes from the start and the outcome must be considered in every profession. An architect imagines the future in the tremendous buildings she builds. An engineer plans for safe bridges and a doctor imagines the future of healthy patients. Do we ask our tech companies to be socially res responsible for the things they design for us? Do they presuppose the social as well as the wonderful transformations? If we ever get digital telepathy on our phones or implanted in our heads, let's be ready to ask the right questions. Thank you.